So we are delighted tonight to have Mike Berkeley um, given a presentation. Mike was actually the first presenter once we became a full-fledged chapter of Wild Ones, which was November of uh, 2018. Brian Hendricks actually presented at the meeting before that when we were a seedling chapter. But uh, Mike uh, drew one of the biggest audiences we have had. And so we're delighted to have him back again tonight. Uh, his presentation style will be different because he's not in person. But um, let me tell you a little bit about Mike. I think most of us actually know him pretty well. But Mike and uh, his spouse, Terry Barnes, uh, I believe started Grow Wild in 1997. Um, I moved to the area in 2004, and I think by 2006, I had discovered Grow Wild, and I uh, went out, the, out there and was completely overwhelmed, probably just came home without, without buying anything. So I went back each year for their festivals and things, eventually began to figure things out, and I was out there last Friday, and it is just looking fantastic. Um, it's, they've done a lot of work uh, with a slower business to get everything re-propagated -prop uh, completely. And it's looking great out there. So we're all looking forward to uh, having free reign of, uh, of the Wild Ones facility, of the Grow Wild facility. I have trouble with the, the wild part being in both the chapter name and the, the native plant nursery. So if I make that mistake, just automatically correct. Um, Mike has had a distinguished career as a nurseryman. Uh, he's been featured in um, American Nurseryman Magazine, not just him, but is, is the Grow Wild facility in Terry as well. He was an innovator in developing green roofs, um, places like the Bill Clinton Library and the Franklin Police Department come to mind. I'm sure he has a longer list of impressive facilities. But Mike and Terry have both been uh, just fundamental participants in the National Area Native Plant Movement. And I'm hoping that Wildwoods is kicking things along a little bit in that regard and that uh, me giving away a few plants or having a plant sale doesn't really dent their business at all. I think we're just adding to the number of people that want to have native plants. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce Mike Berkeley. Take it away, Mike. Well, Mike, you look a little different. Ooh. 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 Get through the jungle here. Oh, oh. Hey, hey, there I hey, hey, everybody. Uh, sorry, I was just doing two of my favorite pastimes, listening to uh, old rock and roll and playing with native plants. Um, so uh, what I think what we're going to do tonight, we're going to have a little silliness going on. We're going to talk about a few things that we've done in the past and a little bit about, about the nursery. And uh, uh, everybody see me okay, I'm guessing. Uh, uh, Richard, yes. Browning, you're doing so, good but so we're we're good all right so i'm gonna do there we go man i like it when this comes you know i just learned how to use a computer uh, so all right we're gonna go through here and and we'll have some q a at the end uh there probably will be several questions about what we do so i'm going to tell a little story uh, a lot of you guys that know me have listened to me speak before know that i can tell stories um, so Grow Wild, uh, there's a, this little native plant nursery out in Fairview, Tennessee, and we've got a lot of plants going on there. If you, you can come by and give us, a, give us a call and come by and see. We're up to over 20,000 perennials in that nursery now. We've got over 6,000 trees in a pot and pot operation. Now, as soon as I say pot, I know somebody out there is smiling. So, no, it's, it's a pot and pot operation, meaning plastic pots. Uh, you know, you, if you've been out there and see, I love my native azaleas. I uh, like the Piedmont azalea, the rhododendron canescence. And you have probably been out there and seen the prairie that we've built. And of course, we burn the prairie every three years. We're on a, we've got two more years and then you can come out and watch this because as I've always said, there's a little pyro in all of us. I've got a great crew, I've had great crews over the years. Um, this is my crew I have now. 
There's a few of them right there. I hope they're watching tonight. They say they would because tomorrow at our employee meeting, there will be a pop quiz, guys. This is the big deal. After you know, 25 years, we've got a trial garden that's crazy. And you can see in that photo there, all these little white metal plates. These are plants that we've planted out for 25 years and we're still going. Every time we get a new species, a new uh, variety of a native plant, we're planted out. And the reason being is that, you know, some of these plants that people will say, uh, oh, someone from East Texas gives us, oh, this is the greatest plant, Mike, you're gonna love it, heat tolerant and all. And what I will say is that, okay, I'll let you know in three to five years, because what we do is we'll trial them so our trial garden is very important to us. Uh, we plant all kinds of different echinaceas, asters, uh, you know, black eyed Susans. And this, some of the things we've learned is that, you know, how aggressive plants can be. For instance, on one of our sheds there a few years ago, we planted a uh, cross vine. And this is what it did. And it's just a beautiful, plant, uh, Hummingbird City. We had no idea it was going to grow out 30 feet under cultivation. So these are things we learn as we go. And having a sidewalk there that, that um, uh, we plant a couple of, of, of lobelias uh, and the next thing you know it kind of takes over. So you can see the cardinal flower there on the right and uh, the rest of that is the big blue lobelia, Lobelia syphilitica. And, you know, I've planted uh, a lot of trees over the, the years, um, kind of give my age away a little bit. Uh, this Schumard Oak, we put in front of the office and, and people will stand there and I say, I planted that tree. And they'll look at me and say, well, God, you're not 90 years old. And so, you know, these, these, a lot of these trees that we planted out, we learned about them. You know, when we see those in their natural habitat, we don't know that they are as fast growing and they got a little more competition. When we take, uh oh, did I just hear? Uh -oh. <laughs> so, so this is, uh, this is the things we're learning with our trial garden. A few years ago, we got uh, the permit with the uh, natural uh, areas, uh, division of natural areas, uh, the Department of Environment Conservation to grow and sell endangered species. And the Echinacea tennesinensis, Tennessee coneflower, was one of the first species on the 1972 Endangered Species Act. We were very proud to have had that plant, which grows right outside of Nashville and nowhere else uh, historically in, in the world, but right outside of Nashville in the cedar glades. And you know, it's beautiful under cultivation. It's one of my favorite green roof plants I love using. Uh, Apios priciana, priceless potato bean that, that occurs, a population occurs just a few miles from us. And we're still working at the propagation protocols to get that plant going. And this is just one of the most outstanding for a federally protected species, the daily foliosa, the leafy prairie clover. I've used it in mixed perennial beds and it's just a performer. And that's where we draw the line there and say, okay, it can't just survive. But for our homeowners, our gardeners, they need to perform. And this plant, who knew that you could take the Alabama snow wreath and plant a small little clump of it, and then it just does something like this. So the importance of what we've done, and not just in what we're growing, but when we put them out into out of production and under cultivation uh, in our trial garden and in installations. So this is what we want. This is what we're, we're striving for, is this is a shade garden here with some native azaleas and the wildflowers. And, you know, it really comes down to, you know, whether you like this or not, you know, you know we as gardeners, this, you know, we want to see, don't just plant a plant and let, let see if it, it dies or not. We want to plant the plant and look at it to perform like this. And we're all gardeners. We are all our gardens. And, and I, every time I show this on a presentation, it scares me because I feel like I'm getting close to that point right there. It's, um, have a walker with the pruners on it. So gardening, I, you know, if you do the research about gardening and active cultivating, tending a garden, what a garden is. All right, fine. This is a garden. 
maybe this is not something we do, or maybe there's somebody in this audience right now that does have a, a garden like this. That's great. This is a garden. I like this. Okay. It's a no mow garden. A lot of brown eyed suits. That's the Re Rebecca or Herta. Well, by the definition of a garden, this is a garden. This is right next to a motel in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah, this is a garden. They, I, they, they said it was a garden because they said lost garden on it. So, but whatever, you know, whatever you're gardening, whatever you like to garden with, okay, um, be a little outside the box with it, be a little creative. And this is a garden. And this is one of the topics for tonight is that we're talking about, you know, cutting back on some of this, this lawn. All right, so just get through, let's bear through some of the graphics and before we get to some of the designs and projects that we've done. You know, what is native, all right? So indigenous to a given area. You know, in, in this last part here, this includes plants that have developed, occurred naturally or existed for many years in an area. We're going to see things happen, I think, in the next few decades in this area that is going to be a little different. And, you know, when I give these presentations, I try not to get up on a soapbox and talk about um, heat, uh, global warming, climate change. All I can say is that I'm growing native plants from the deep south like I never could before. And I think we're going to start seeing them migrate north. And then some of these that we've been used to for centuries in this area are going to start migrating north out of this area. That's my prediction. So in about 200, 300 years, y'all call me back and let me know what you see about that. All right, and then what is the natives, you know, and it's all a relative thing, you know. I, I, I go around and around with people. Every time they come to the nursery, I meet with them at their homes that they, they ask these questions. People that are not in wild ones. You know, I thought it was funny that uh, Doug Tallamy said that why, why does he always give talks to the wild ones uh, chapters? He says because, you know, uh, it's singing to the choir, but yeah, but that choir sings the loudest. And, you know, when I get people that have no idea what a native plant is, I have to explain to them, well, you know, if it's on the eastern part of, of the Mississippi River, you know, we grow a lot of that. Um, we grow a lot of plants from the state of Tennessee. And then I love the truly purest indigenous species that occurs here on this property in Fairview. Well, why go native? Well, gosh, there's, there's so many reasons. You know, something that's really hot here lately has been the edible part of it because people are staying home. And, you know, Richard said something about our business during the, the, the virus, now, uh, staying home. Well, our business is staying pretty steady because people are gardening. And, you know, we use these plants, you know, and in, in, in sometimes in caution, and we'll explain a little bit about this later. But as far as what has turned the gardening public around, I guess this book has done it more than anything that we know of. And when Doug came out with this and said, you know, it, you know, turf grass is not necessarily a good, healthy, native, uh, <laughs> natural entity. Um, and that, you know, if we want more birds, we want more bugs, uh, doing something that is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, more in the native and, and can sustain life a little bit better. Uh, and I have to, whenever I show the Asclepsia syriaca, the common milkweed, I love showing this shot because you see right in the middle there, one of the reasons that we grow the milkweeds, you know, swamp milkweed, is you see the monarch caterpillar. And then there, here we go, the controversy, species versus cultivars. And I, back when I was co-hosting the uh, Native Plant podcast, uh, there was a, one of our guests on the show from University of Georgia. He's written several books, mostly about non-native perennials. And then he wrote one about native cultivars, and he coined the name nativars. Well, that just wore me out. Because if we separate these native plants from other cultivars, these cultivated native plants from other cultivars, then we're not able to blend in with the people. If someone loves their peonies that their grandmother passed on to them, that's great. Put some Tennessee coneflower next to them. We want them to be 
call all cultivars that we can be user friendly in all our guards, mixed gardens. All right, so here we go. Let's get into some of the projects. The natural designing with native plants and, and some changes. So, you know, over the years, we have met so many people in, in doing some of the research and getting back to some of the jobs that we did over 25 years, have met so many people. And back in the old days, um, 25 years ago when we first started, you know, it was actually kind of hard to put keep bread on the table because natives, natives were not hot uh, like they are now. And so we were looking at, you know, if you just want to do a native plant garden, you know, let's prioritize this. What's important to you? Well, I want blueberries. Fine. We'll fix you up. We'll take care of you. I want edible. Uh, I want birds. Okay, fine. All of a sudden, it went from one end to the other, and now we're doing all kinds of projects um, and making changes in people's yards that I would have guessed two decades ago would have been impossible to do. All right, so a big one that we did a few years ago, we got with a client. Uh, she was in Belmede. She is in Belmede, and she has all this turf grass. And she understood that this is a little too much. She was looking at the maintenance. She wanted butterflies, okay, butterflies and birds. And we came up with the idea is that with her driveway going through in this huge expanse of turf grass, why don't we build this huge butterfly garden that will go across the driveway? So we, we removed the side, staked out an area, did a little painting in there. Yeah, me and a paint gun, is, it's a dangerous thing. I just paint everywhere. If you see orange flagging, uh, orange paint on the side of a billboard, don't, don't call me. Um, but I, I use paint a lot to get that visual. And by the way, I've been asked a lot of this lately of some of my new clients and consultations I'm picking up. I, I quit doing paper designs. I quit doing the CAD program designs. Now I'm 3D because it really is hard to communicate to the client what you're trying to do with that plant in a one or two dimension. So we do this. We'll set the plants out, get a kind of an idea. I'll get with the client and say, okay, this plant's going to do this. Baptisia australis, the false blue indigo, will get this big, almost looks like a shrub in maturity. It may do it slowly, but ultimately it gets pretty good size, four by four foot, easy. So you, you ex explain that to the client and space these plants out. We did a walk through, walkway through that. Uh, not only is it going to be a walkthrough, but a drive through butterfly garden. And there you see some of the finished product there. So every time that she or guests come home or come into her house, they're driving through. They don't have to get out of the car, you know. And I've always said that, you know, if you really want to get to know a plant or a garden, get intimate with it by getting into it. I love plants that touch me. I like plants to reach out and grab my leg, you know, so to speak. Um, and then I like those plants that makes you stop in the garden and kneel over and look. And maybe it's something fragrant you want to smell. But to do that with a drive-through you drive slowly. So we did things like the phlox paniculata gina, which actually came from a lady in Bellevue here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, outstanding butterfly plant. And yeah, we did put the Ascapsia syriaca. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this plant. What we know, because we watched it out in our meadows and our prairies naturally occurring. And what we have done in our tri own trial gardens, we know this is a very aggressive plant. And I will go ahead and tell you right now, careful in putting that in your, your per mixed perennial bed. It will take over. Some of you probably already know that. So what we decided to do is to take uh, plastic pots, cut the bottom out of them, sink them down in the ground, and plant the plants in those pots. Now, sometimes they would still go out. You know, if you've grown this plant before in a garden, those roots go everywhere. It's not just reseeding itself like they can do, but they're spreading vegetatively. So putting them in and treating them like a creeping mint. You know, we've, we've had to do that with the non-native mint before because it's so aggressive. Sink it into a pot, keep a couple of inches to lip above ground, 
and see if that doesn't control that. But as, as far as I, I believe the local, local butterfly book, uh, Rita Venable wrote that it's the number one source for the monarch um, because it's higher in the toxin and it doesn't have all the hairs on the leaf. And look at the size of that leaf. That's a buffet line for the monarch caterpillar. We also put in the uh, Silphium perfoliate on the cup plant. And I love this plant. It's great for the birds. Uh, if some of you don't know, uh, it's called cup plant because exactly what you see there. If you look in the middle there, there's water. And it could be from dew, it could be from a rain. Birds will come, goldfinch especially, will come and drink from that, just like a bird bath. And then we put the Monarda fistulosa in there, the wild bergamot also. So let, let me, um, break away just for a moment and tell you a little bit about scale. Scale is something that we, and I don't mean scale that, that you got to, you know, remove from the bathtub. I'm talking about scale of how tall some of these plants are. If we were working with a garden a quarter of this size, some of these plants I would not have used. The scale would have been way off. Um, for instance, that cup plant, that silphium, you're talking about eight feet every bit. Okay, and, and can get quite wide. Um, we used an aster in here, the willow leaf aster, and it's a little aggressive also, but it's the latest blooming aster, a perennial that we know of. Um, and of course it catches the monarchs and their migration on, on into November even. Um, but you gotta be careful with it because it's so tall, so big. Uh, so with scale, you know, we, you know, we want some of these plants. If you're wanting a milkweed, there's the butterfly weed or the swamp milkweed that is toned down compared to the common milkweed. All right, this is, we've had some great opportunities, especially in, in urban suburbia sites. Something that has really happened here lately is people are saying, I, you know, I've had enough of this turf grass. And if you've got a small yard, okay, uh, maybe you don't need turf grass. And this is over in East Nashville where um, there's so many people over there that are converting over and saying, okay, I want natives, I want edible, I want butterflies, I don't want to mow. Uh, and this is what we end up with. This is uh, in the yard of Alex Lockwood. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna show some of the things that he's done. I've actually got some flowers here he's made. Uh, but this is the kind of art he, he does. Um, you can look him up on the his website and do a Google search on Alex Lockwood and you'll, you'll see um, um, some of his artwork that he uses. Salvia gregii, we put that in his yard. It's a hummingbird plant. He wanted hummingbirds. That was a big deal. He's, he's got two young boys and he has put the feeders out and he sees the hummingbirds. And I said, well, you know, before you put that sugar water out there, what did they go to? Anything that's red and tubular. Now the Salvia gregii naturally occurs southwest of us, okay, which gives it all the heat drought tolerance. I think the common name, autumn sage, is a bit bad name. This has been blooming since April, May, and it will bloom right up till the first frost in the fall. You know, I can't tell you how many yards I've gone into, and there was an oak leaf hydrangea that's about eight feet tall covering a bedroom window. And they'll say, well, what can I do about that? And I'll say, well, you know, get rid of that. And so what has happened with our landscapes are toning down in size, so are the plants are toning down in size. And probably the most exciting dwarf oak leaf hydrangea that's come along is the hydrangea quercifolia ruby slippers. And you'll see why it's called ruby slippers. It has the same white bloom as all the oak leaf hydrangeas do, but it fades to an amethyst pink color but that's maximum height right there. You'll get up four, four and a half feet and equally as wide. So a great one to put under your bedroom window. We put this, you know, if you go around and look at our designs that we've done, we freely put shrubs out in the middle of the yard. Remember how we were, we were born and raised with shrubs hugging the house. And then we had lawn out in the middle. Well, so who wrote that rule? Who made that, that rule? I believe in putting shrubs out there as long as they don't get out of hand and putting them out there. And again, if you can walk through it like we did in this, this yard, uh, good. Butterfly weed. It's just hard not to put in butterfly weed. Uh, that orange flower, you know, and drought tolerant, heat tolerant, 
Um, monarchs will go to it. <clears throat> All butterfly will go to it. So you can see what we've done there, landscape. All right, suburban overhaul. 2008, I met with a gentleman over uh, in the uh, Forest Hills area, <clears throat> and he says, I'm just done with this. And you know, how many times have we seen it? A foster holly has bookends on both the ends, and boy, they got creative with this. They limbed it up, you know, so they could see the uh, out the window under the foster holly. And then some kind of big arborvita uh, or a yew, or, <clears throat> or maybe native, a Canadian hemlock that's been made into a uh, honey, uh, honey hive, um, but it was evergreen, 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 evergreen. Okay, so I said that's fine. Let's get rid of all that. Okay, and start from scratch. It's a lot easier to start from scratch. And this shot here, which shows a clean slate, is now that. In fact, that photo was taken this morning. I had a, another consultation with the gentleman after years. That's one of my, I, I absolutely love doing that. I tell people right up front, it says, don't try to kill yourself in doing this native plant. You know, we're psychologically, we're, we're not used to this stuff. We're not used to putting things on both sides of the sidewalk as you lead through the front door or shrubs out in the middle of the lawn. You know, so do this in phases. Let's pick a little piece here of your property, do that, and then let's, let's expand. And that's what he's doing. He's calling me to do more uh, in this landscape. And so there on the right, what you saw on an arbor was this plant. One of my favorite hummingbird plants uh, is the coral honeysuckle. There is many cultivars of it. <clears throat> many of them are now where they will rebloom. Well, if hummingbirds are around all summer, why not have the food around all summer in the cultivars that rebloom? So that's his landscape back then. This is what it looks like today. Full. Be gone, you Ivy, be gone. A client that we've known for a few years <clears throat> over in the Belmont uh, Boulevard area. Uh, I want you to note the planting there. There's two hackberries in there, almost exactly measured from the sidewalk, the same distance, okay? Uh, and on some of these photos I'm about to show you is going to show you also some changes that that has made. So she had evergreen, 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 evergreen in ground cover, monkey grass, uh, hellebores, which is not a bad plant for a non-native. Uh, deer won't eat it. I keep hearing that all the time. But look what's going up the trees of those two hackberries, okay? It's English ivy. We've got winter creeper in there as well. So how do you, I mean, what's the diversity? Where are, your, where are your butterflies in a landscape like that? So again, we ripped everything out. And like I said, the hellebores, you know, they're okay. She decided she would wanted them. We left them in. That's what you see, that green clump there on the left. Oh, there he goes, that paint gun. We start painting out circles and squares and you know amoebas and you know this is where we're going to put the plants so this is after a couple of years of getting established now that hackberry there that you see that was the one on the left is gone uh nes came in and said look it's getting over here on our old power line we're gonna have to do something about it after they butchered it several times she says you know what I'm ready for a sun garden. And that's we started the transition. The tree, the small tree you see there is one of my favorite understory trees that can handle the heat. And it's the two winged silver bell that came out of the deep south. Beautiful big white blooms. The uh, collared looking plant there in the foreground is one of my favorite black eyed Susans that also came out of the south, southeast, uh, southwest, <clears throat> is the uh, uh, giant uh, black eyed Susan, the big black eyed Susan. And that can get up uh, six feet tall every bit. So um, she is transitioning to more of a sun garden. In fact, you see what's on that hackberry. There's a big X. You know what that means? Going to be gone. So this garden went from a shade 
ground cover, evergreen non-native ground cover to shade wildflowers. And now it's converting over to sun uh, flowers and, and butterfly plants. I would say that's an improvement. Well, all gone. Leave me a little grass, please. And I know exactly what you went through some of your minds. So this is uh, a house down in Franklin, not too far on the square on Third Avenue South. Um, and this is the way it used to look. And this is very typical. If you grow, drive around in the urban suburbia areas of some of these small towns, you see thousands of houses that look like this and the symmetry. Whatever you put on one side, you're gonna put it on the other side and you hug the house with evergreen, evergreen, evergreen. And then you lined the sidewalk with some. Well, she called me in and said, well, I've got another issue. And you see the fence there, this is on the side street. Someone was, uh, there was a police chase. Someone uh, going 100 miles an hour took a curve right there. Well, let's just say they didn't really take that curve uh, and wiped out the fence. And we said, okay, well, that's, that's a problem. Let's see if we can do something about that. Oh yeah, okay, let them hit that. So this is what we converted it over. So we removed all the turf grass, all the non-native in the front yard. She wanted nothing out, out there that was existing before. We did native azaleas in there. We did all kinds of wildflowers. Uh, honeysuckle on the, on the fence. This is, uh, you know, the red buds have just gotten crazy here lately. <clears throat> There's all kinds of new varieties. You know, and I, I have to say, you know, maybe, well, Terry says I'm getting a little out of hand with the red buds. I just, the fact is that you could put a red bud in a parking lot and look at some of the commercial applications and from some of the box stores and look, you'll see. They're, they're ex existing without irrigation in many cases in hot, dry conditions. But you don't have to go with the regular old red bud. This is a weeping red bud that actually has a dark red leaf as it emerges and it's called ruby slipper or ruby uh, falls. And I love the form of it. And yeah, sure, uplight it if you wish. There you can see Virginia sweet spires around it. So we did put the wisteria, a native wisteria on the fence and the fragrance has been crazy. We put the Kentucky wisteria there. Um, now, if you've ever grown the non-native wisteria, you first thing in your mind is that, oh God, that's gonna take over the world. Well, the native wisterias, the American wisteria, the frutescens, a wisteria frutescens and the Kentucky wisteria, the microstatues, are not as aggressive. Now they'll still grow and we have to, you know, prune it back every once in a while, but much more forgiving than the Chinese Asian uh, species that are outlawed. They are outlawed in some states in the South. Remember that uh, those boulders? Well, it's a shady area over there. Okay, so we put ferns some uh, river oats, some uh, uh, native sedges, and some other wildflowers over there. And like I said, let, let them take that curve a little too fast. They're not gonna hit that fence again. They're gonna hit those boulders and I think there'll be a little damage with that. So a little protection there. That's where you know the, the design was a little more functional as well. Notice the moss and, and the alum root that's reseeded itself on top of that moss. In the backyard, we just continued doing what we're doing, but we did, you know, the oak leaf hydrangeas and we, we spread things around. But she wanted um, a little bit of turf grass back there. And I'll show you, you can see that in the foreground. This is a hot tree right now. They took the native American smoke tree and crossed it with the non-native European smoke bush, which gave it, that, it gave it that red leaf color. Very fast growing, it gets the big leaf, like the American smoke tree. And it's a very heat and drought tolerant tree like the American smoke tree. She's got her sitting areas over there. And one of the other problems that she had is that her bedroom or her living quarters actually was upstairs. <clears throat> and what she was doing is looking down into a side street. Well, with the power lines that you see there on, in, the, in the background, we could not go with old maples, oaks, anything to kind of screen out that, that her neighbors in the, in the road, especially for traffic noise. 
So we had to go in with columnar trees. And the slender silhouette that was introduced by uh, nurseryman Don Shadow is an outstanding columnar tree. And you can see from her windows there, the early years of how that's uh, filling in. Look at the fall color. I mean, you can't beat that. That's on a slender silhouette. So see back in the back there, you see some of that turf grass, okay? Well, why did she want, if she eradicated and want no turf grass in the front yard, why did she want some turf grass, a little square of it in the backyard like this? Okay, that, let me introduce you to Elton John. That's his name, that's Elton John. And if it was just him, that'd eh, be okay. But there's a bunch of them. And so, she, she has, she does fostering for all these small dogs. Um, and she has saved many lives and made some families very happy with this, but she's got to have a place for them to go. And I would rather them go out on that turf grass than to go on my Virginia sweet spires I put in there. Pollinator gardens are all the buzz. So we all know Owl's Hill. In fact, uh, I was there today and, um, you know, if, let me just say, if, if you have some time and you want to go mask free and spend some time out in a garden, help them out there at Owl's Hill. Uh, they really, you know, they're a nonprofit and they're doing a great thing over there in, in uh, teaching the public, especially with, uh, children um, and adults. So uh, when we came over to them, they, they said, well, we need some help here. This is what they were calling their pollinator garden. And it was just overgrown with a lot of non-native and overgrown with some native. And yeah, there's the, uh, the uh, Sclepsia syriaca, the common milkweed is in there. But remember what I was talking about scale, okay? So we removed it. We had weed eat it, we pulled it, we cut it back, we dug it out. And this is what they have now. And, I, and they do a good job in maintaining it. And they do it with the help of the public. And I, again, I would highly recommend that people go over there or call them up and say, you know, what can we do to help out? We did a planting there up in the woods and I actually got to watch Richard Hitt do some digging on top of rocks and root, planting some of these wildflowers. And Richard, I know you remember that. In this garden, and you can see that white there, that is the Pycnathemum muticum, that is the hoary mountain mint. And it's one of my favorite mountain mints as far as all the species go because it has a glossier leaf which equates to more of that hoary look which is the white leaf and we were talking about it earlier before the meeting started but pollinators 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 you can count a dozen different native bees and butterflies on that plant And of course, I've got it, you know, we're talking about some of the more radical changes that we've had from um, one end to the other. <clears throat> this was this. Um, ages ago, it seems like, I walked up, walked up nine flights of stairs, nine stories, with a flashlight because electricity was out, to go up and look at putting a green roof on top of this building. And this is sitting at the corner right off the corner of uh, 8th and 9th Avenue and Church Street, just south of Church Street. It's the Westview Condominium. And looking at that and how hot and sterile and just not alive. And I'm thinking, okay, how we're going to do this. And we did. And we built a green roof on top of Westview. And as you come out the door, and the tenants know this, the people that are there at the HOA and the condos, they come out the door. Every time they come out the door, that's what they're facing. This is a fall shot here. You got some of the fall color going on with some of the, uh, the birch there. That is a, on the, the, um, the, the tree on the right against the Sheraton there. That is an American smoke tree. 
what we found out by putting these plants up on a green roof with got limited rooting out, they become more dwarf. So a smoke tree that gets up 30 feet plus in your backyard will only top out at about 10 to 15 feet. And I have to say, just, you know, watching this, we have a, a maintenance contract with them to maintain this every month, go over there and kind of clean it up a little bit. You'd be amazed what comes in, birds drop in of some of the non-native and aggressive. We've seen uh, you know, a, a butterfly bush, we've seen nandinas, you know, up, up there, uh, tree of heaven, the alanthus. <clears throat> uh, get up there. So we pull those out. We don't want those up there. This is 100% all native green roof. Now that was a big difference than what I first walked up on years ago. There's some of our crew up there doing the maintenance and we love going up there every month because we see something different every month. Before these oak leaf hydrangeas were in bloom, those baptisias that are in the foreground there along the sidewalk, they were in bloom. And this is a dwarf oak leaf hydrangea. This is one called Sykes Dwarf. This is one of our new additions up there. They wanted a red bud up there that had a little pizzazz. This is a variety called Carolina Sweetheart. And look at that leaf and it's really pretty. <clears throat> the photo is taken from a sitting area and they'll go up there and back when they did have the 4th of July fireworks, you talk about a commanding view of the firework display sitting right there. And when you're up there, it's always about the wind because of that elevation. That's prairie drop seed in the foreground. Love the movement. All right, so we'll end it here. Uh, we are open. Um, it, it, a few, few months ago, we were closed. We kept the gate shut and we were doing curbside pickup. And people were very patient considering you know, the situation. We would put the plants outside the gate and they would load it themselves. And in some cases, when it was a 15 gallon a tree, a eh, bit of a challenge. Now we are open uh, part-time, if you will, on you know, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Um, it, it is nine, uh, nine to three, nine to three Wednesday, Wednesday, Friday, and then nine to 12 on Saturday. And then we're still um, open for business for curbside on the other days of the week and of course closed for on Sunday. So feel free to give us a call. And if you've never been there before, pick one of those three days to come out. We are doing self-guided shopping. We will hand you a, a price list, walk around, Take a look at, at what's going on in the nursery. You'll see a lot of things you've never seen before. All right, Mike, thank you very much. Um, right. The way you uh, clap if you're muted is you go to the reactions button on the bottom right and click the clapping hands, but you're welcome to unmute oh. yourself at this point. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> thank you, Mike. That was great. Um, <laughs> I like those before and after shots uh, quite, quite a bit. It's just hard to... Um, I, I appreciate your, your sense of vision in imagining a transition hey, like that. Hey, Rich. Yeah. Let me show, I'm going to share my screen. Most, okay. at least half uh, of these, at least half of these plants came from him. And you talked only about half. Before. Well, <laughs> yeah. you talked about before and after. Tell me when oh, you, yeah. this is in all my presentations when I give on birds. And that's, that's actually the real estate picture when we bought that house 26 years ago. And I give my wife all the credit for this. But this is what he's talking about, getting rid of turf. This is what my wife has done in 25 years. Uh-huh. Beautiful. Very nice. And every, every year or two, she cuts out a chunk of that grass right the next one will be to the right there by the car. She'll just go further out to that. And she'll, and she'll just plant something. And, and she's been bugging me. We're doing another trip to <laughs> get some plants. But everything in there, well, I, I got to rephrase that. I think we're, tr we're trying to hit 70% native because we started late. So about 30, 40% of that is still her 
and I'm not sure, I don't think azalea, or what's that, what's that green and light green plant that everybody has? Uh, in the foreground? Uh, I can't remember what it's called. They're low, the big leaves, and they've got Busted. light green streaks in them. I want to say azaleas, but it's not azaleas. But either way, she's hostas. got probably hostas. hostas. I don't think that's native, but she has a few hostas in there. But what we started today was um, what we started last week were those uh, uh, common milkweeds. We put three in the middle of that, and when I heard Mike say that these things will take over, I'm like, really? But we did notice that one when we found them and we dug them up. We never knew this about the common milkweed. When we dug them up, we thought we were just pulling them up and the, the roots just below them. But we were finding these shoots going off two feet to another direction and it started another plan. I never realized milkweed did that till we dug them up. So anyway, I just wanted to show that's what he's talking about. Just cutting off a piece of grass um, a little at a time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Appreciate it. Good, good pictures, Brian. Uh, Mike, let me uh, pick up on the milkweed being aggressive. Um, I think in my little uh, suburban one-third acre lot, I had 130 common milkweeds at one point in the early spring. And so I embraced a Michigan State University program called Regrow Your Milkweed. And the idea is that you pick, you choose half your milkweed. It can be, you know, uh, contiguous half or whatever and you cut it back to three or four inches from the ground and let it start growing again. And then in the fall, you have some fresher milkweed. Um, so you wait, wait for it to start blooming maybe. You do the cutback, that would be June in this area. And then in the fall, you have some more, some fresher milkweed uh, that the monarch eggs are more, it's more digestible for them. And so this, this is a big citizen science project that Michigan State is conducting right now, but I didn't, do it so much for the citizen science. I had, I had too many darn milkweeds in my yard. And so I saw this as a way to, to solve my abundant milkweed problem. You know, as a plant, it's an outstanding plant. Uh, if, if you ever go up to one in bloom and just smell the fragrance, it's amazing. And look oh, it's at great. all pollinators are on that, those pink flowers. Uh, now it may be standing above your head a little bit, which is, that's fine. I mean, you know, the butterflies love it, the bees love it. Uh, and, and ultimately, we want the monarch to love it, too. So it's just a, it, you know, um, it's a thing that we say in the garden, in, in a cultivated garden, it's called a thug. And I hate to use that word for any native plant. Uh, but there are some of those plants out there that are really great for the back 40, but in a cultivated garden. Another one is uh, uh, the goldenrod, the tall goldenrod. Some people call it Canada golden rod, um, the Solidago canadensis. And, you know, that's one wildflower we don't grow because it is so aggressive. And, you know, the funny thing about it is that if you check out Heather Holmes' book about the North American bees, uh, we had her on our podcast at one time a few years ago, and she, what she'll tell you, golden rods are number one for the pollinators, for the bees, especially because of when they bloom in the late summer or early fall. But the, go the tall golden rod, pretty aggressive. Be careful with it. That's one I would call a thug. Yeah, I would not plant a sylphium perfoliatum in my small lot <laughs> either. Yeah. I, I enjoy seeing them in, in you know, other places, but I don't think my yard will support that. Uh, we got a few questions. Let me uh, throw them out there at you. Um, so uh, Laura misunderstood. Uh, she thought you said pot quiz uh, for that you were going to <laughs> so your, your employees your employees might have a good day tomorrow it's the ponytail oh yeah 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 which i believe richard's going to grow one brian's going to grow one um i think if we're going to stay at home and not get haircuts we're all going to have yeah. ponytail. that's a logical thing to do uh, a lot so of people are just going to explain the pot and pot and pot uh, or pop quick, yeah. yeah. There's no ponytail coming out of this. <laughs> well, <laughs> not, okay. Not gonna happen, guys. Um, pigtails, maybe. Um, <laughs> braided. So uh, that large uh, Rebecca you were talking about was that Rebecca Maxima? 
It is. It's Rebecca Maxima. Um, I was fortunate. Uh, Terry and I went down to visit a good friend of ours in Nacogdoches, Texas, in East Texas, and uh, we we uh, went out into a field where they were. Um, it was just like any other Black Eyed Susan that we would have here, where you see that kind of a model, typical uh, model culture in it. Uh, and they, we had to get up in the back of a pickup truck to take photos because they were tall. They were just beautiful. One of the things I love about that plant is that it does get tall on a, what I would call kind of a, a wispy stem uh, with a big old seed head. You saw that on the flower, a big seed head. As it's going into seed, goldfinch will feed on it and ride that like a, an amusement park ride. Um, <laughs> And uh, which is really fun to watch. So it's just where you've got this native plant that gives you more uh, joy even after the bloom. We see a lot of plants like that. Mabtesiums yeah. with those seed heads, the way they are on going into the winter, makes little baby rattles, rattlers. So, um, so yeah, the black eye suit, the tall black eye Susan, is Rebecca Maxima, outstanding plant. Uh, right outside my front window, I've got some Retivita pinata, the gray-headed coneflower. Yeah. And it's about six feet tall, and the goldfinches do the same uh, joy ride on it because they, they, they'll bend it all the way halfway over. <laughs> um, let's see what we got next here. A lot of compliments. I don't want to give you any uh, those, those are my cousins. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question? You bet. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, my name's Karen Bookout. My husband and I live in Gallatin. And uh, we just bought our home a little over a year ago. It's on a little over two acres. About a quarter or about a third of the acre is heavily wooded. And we started attacking some of the non-native uh, undergrowth. Um, and I'd like to plant a woodland garden with natives. Uh, we did discover that we have some trillium in there. Uh, I didn't know what that was and then discovered it's fairly rare. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it, trillium, different species of trillium covered every square foot, even out in the cedar glades, which you would think, okay, what are trillium doing out there? You get off into the woods, into the deeper soils, you're going to find trilliums there. So it's just that during development, uh, a lot of times that topsoil got scraped off. And when the topsoil got scraped off, so did those uh, shallow rooted uh, rhizomes of the trillium. So oh, okay. that, that tells me a lot. If you've got trillium growing there then you've got good soil to get a woodland garden started in there. Uh, was it bush honeysuckle as the invasives? You remember? Uh, we have uh, privet. Uh, we have so many different invasives. It's scary. Uh, I actually um, received a non-native list uh, or invasive plant list from uh, someone in the Ag Center, Tennessee Ag Center, uh, to help me identify and get rid of some of the things. But it's going to be a, a, a several year project. Um, but I, ha I had another question. Um, my husband and I moved from Florida and I had a large butterfly hummingbird garden in Florida and am progressively working on that here. And we do have a lot of turf grass um, outside of this third of an acre of woods. And I have slowly started incorporating some pollinator gardens. I'm using a general term, pollinator gardens. Um, what's the best way to tackle, if we're on a somewhat limited budget and can't afford to hire you to come out and remove that turf grass, what's the best way to tackle getting that turf grass out of there um, and are there specific natives that you would suggest starting with? I know that's a really big, wide-ranging question. Well, um, if, you know, there's several different ways to remove turf grass. If you go to Home Depot or a box store, look at their sod cutter that you can rent. I've known several people that said, okay, uh, if we want to remove the sod grass our set our the turf ourselves um and we don't want to use chemical uh, black right. plastic is iffy okay and it's been done before but it's still iffy uh, especially with things like bermuda which is a south african species that, that of course the golf courses love and we don't um right. uh, it's a grass um you you can actually cut it like carpet 
and remove so like it. sod. Um, like sod. And I and I'm just guessing anywhere from forty to fifty dollars, you know, to to rent that. Um, it's a heavy machine, and it's got to be because it's got to cut into the turf grass. We have our own sod cutting machine, and uh, the guys manhandle that thing and, and cutting it out. Some of those projects that you saw in the presentation this evening, that's how we actually did remove the, the turf grass, those mm -hmm. do side cutting. Um, as far as the plants to start off with, you know, get your ironclad plants. Here's what I tell people, okay? If you go to a box store, a garden center, and you see a plant up on a shelf and it's native, chances are that's the kind of plant you want. And I know that sounds crazy, but a lot of those plants, and I'm not talking about the frou fru looking cone flowers, but you see a straight species there. Um, and the chances are, you know, cause they're not gonna carry anything but the mainstream common native plants uh, in their native section. Uh, and those are pretty, gonna be pretty tough plants. Uh, if you go for a prairie plant, Baptisia, some of the native grasses, uh, the, the cone flowers. Uh, you know, you're talking about some pretty tough plants because think about where they have to exist in, in the wild. In lean soils, hard exposure, no water, no fertilizer. Right. We, I do have a fairly good start. I have a lot of milkweed that I, I bought some. I have common milkweed and I have the other milkweed, the red and green, red and yellow flowers. I can't remember the name of it. And I do have coral honeysuckle and uh, on numerous others. Um, but um, so I have a bit of a start. It's clay soil. It's hard pan clay soil. How much uh, amending, what do I need to do to that clay soil? Uh, a lot of times all you have to do is get some kind of organic material in it. And sometimes our compost that we make is not for our sun loving gardens. Uh, though, though that, you know, those gardens like it lean. Uh, your clay may be all they really need and just need mm -hmm. to get organic. If you take pine bark, and I've actually taken pine bark mini nuggets and laid that on the ground and tilled that in, trying to get mm -hmm. some organic down in it. The other thing too about clay soils is that they're anaerobic. Um, there is uh, no oxygen in them. You dig down into that clay and it smells like a septic tank you're digging into. Well, that's the anaerobic bacteria, so there's no oxygen. So by working in big pieces of organic material like the pine bark and tilling that in, you're actually going to get aeration going, oxygen down in it, and then as those pieces start to decompose down in the ground, uh, then you start leaving the air pockets. So a lot of times it's not making it the soil rich. Now, if you're talking about a fern glade, woodland wildflowers, you know, you're talking about something a little different there is that they like a little bit more of that compost type soil. Thank you so much for that great information. Okay, Mike, uh, you still, you still game? All right, let's go. I'm okay. here, I, you know what, let's go until two o'clock in the morning. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Um, uh, someone, by the way, pointed out it's not just the ponytail, it's the tie-dyed shirt. <laughs> this is that was Laura. Indigo. Terry made this. We have I, these indigo. My employees will tell you all about it because they all have indigo uh, dyed shirts. So we had these classes uh, last year for the public and you sign up for. We're going to do that once the, the COVID is uh, maybe get us back. Um, and uh, so she made this for me. And I've just, something about indigo. Blue. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a general question that actually it came up at an earlier meeting that the Tennessee Valley chapter uh, had, uh, a roundtable meeting. Uh, the general question is, uh, what can you deadhead in terms of uh, these perennials and have them come back with new blooms? And I've tried Pinstemon and that doesn't seem to work, but I have good luck with Coreopsis. Coreopsis, uh, uh, comb flowers to me, uh, can do that. A lot of your echinaceas. Uh, we've done that with some Tennessee cone flower. It, it did. Um, uh, golden rods, you know, can, if there's some of the earlier blooming golden rods. Um, as far as the rebloom, you know, I, I'm not a, you know, I talked about some of the varieties that we actually grow that are rebloomers. And, you know, but as far as the straight species, if you go out in the wild and look at these, okay, and like I said, you know, what's well, been fun to go up on the Westview condominium is to see that garden every 30 days changing. And I think that's the beauty of, of, um, 
of a good design perennial garden or a mixed wood, wood, uh, woody garden, shrubs, perennials, grasses. Grasses, how valuable they are uh, that they give us something in December and January and February, okay? So I'm more going to put plants in there that instead of me trying to get them to rebloom, I may have a plant right next to it that blooms in August compared to, yeah. to June. So. Yeah, I've seen uh, what Patty mentioned earlier, the Chattanooga Area uh, Pollinator Partnership. They do uh, charts that have you know, each species they're, they're targeting and when the bloom time is on a horizontal line. So right. you can actually glance at it and make sure you don't have any gaps in your, in your bloom time. Everything overlaps. How, how beautiful artwork that is that you've got a painting that changes constantly for 12 months out of the year. So, And speaking of artwork, this is my segue into talking about what, what Alex Lockwood uh, has done. He called me back in the winter and says, can you give me a list of endangered species, fairly listed endangered species? And I said, well, sure. His media, by the way, shotgun shells. So this is a Tennessee coneflower that he made with shotgun shells. He did pass a floor. Think about the passion flower vine, our native wildflower, made with shotgun shells. He did uh, Helianthus fertisolatus, which is a fairly listed sunflower. I mean, so I just have to, I, I'm, you know, of course, Terry had to get some of these, but these were made. <laughs> Yeah, look at that. I mean, that's Tennessee cornflower. Anyway, I had to I had to do a plug. For All right. So, how many props approximately do you have sitting around you to just reach out and grab? Well, I've got some dogs around here too. Okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Somebody was asking. Uh, I know that you uh, eschewed CAD and three D computer programs, if they're wondering if, if you have any recommendations for software to map a garden. You know, like I said, I, we spent thousands of dollars on a computer generated program and it was actually called Design uh, out of California. And it had all the bells and whistles and you could drag and drop and you have color and you can do a 3D rendering of it and everything. I still, as expensive as that program was and I worked it, I still had a hard time communicating to my clients what I was trying to say. And you know, how many times have um, a designer, and I've done this, put a design together and then get there at the site, put the plants out and said, oh, you know what? That focal point from that kitchen window, I didn't realize, you know, and maybe this is not the plant to put in that one spot. So I really like to do it this way, is, and I would invite people to do it that way, is that, you know, learn, first thing you got to do is know what the plants are. But that's a lot of species out there. And then if you take the cultivars of some of those species, um, you know, knowing what they got to do, but know the culture of the plant. And if you know the culture of the plant and then how to read the tags, everybody that sells plants has some kind of description on that tag and it tells how tall they get. And if it says it gets six feet tall, maybe that's something you don't want to put right at the edge of your garden. Um, so I, you know, I'm all about doing the 3d, um, program by being there and citing them with, you know, whether it's trees, shrubs, uh, I'll stand back before COVID, I would stand in front of their house at a window that they looked at in the dead of the winter, typically a kitchen window with a seat and look out that window and say, okay, what are you going to see in January? If snow on the ground, if we ever get it again. Um, and what, what, what do you want to see? Oh, you know, if you think about it, spring, summer, fall is a piece of cake. Take care of the winter first. So, you know, there's a few of us out there. Um, uh, I've seen some, some amazing designs. I'm a big fan of Larry Weiner. You know, he's, he's given talks to the uh, several chapters of the uh, Wild Ones before, and he gave a, had a class actually here in Nashville last year. I'm a big fan of his. He's a little bit like a hybrid where he likes to do the 3D, but his clients are requiring the designs, the paper designs. Um, and, but that just kind of gives you a general, you know, but if you're going to do a CAD design, uh, you're going to, if you're going to pay, you're going to get what you pay for. Um, and uh, the, 
the plant list that they have in their data, data bank um, is missing a lot of natives. Let's just say that. Yeah. You know, one, of, one of my favorite shrubs right now is the Dyer Villa. <clears throat> um, it's the uh, Southern Bush Honeysuckle. I almost scared to say the common name because it, that Bush Honeysuckle comes out. Of it. I love using those. And you're not going to find that in any CAD program. Uh, it's a great massing subshrub for our smaller landscapes. So hope that helped answer a question. Yeah. Um, well, we're happy to have um, people from all over. We've got a few members of the uh, Tennessee Valley chapter. We've got a member or two from the Southern Kentucky chapter in Bowling Green. Um, and Janine is the president up there. She's, she's done a great job um, getting her chapter up and running during COVID. But she, Janine says there's a quote that she read somewhere, that gardening is art in four dimensions, changing with time. So that, that just reinforces okay. what you said. Who wrote that? Janine uh, Grossmeyer, the president of the Southern Kentucky Wild Ones chapter. And she wrote that? that oh, she book. read it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I, I guess we don't know who wrote it. Oh man, that's great. I mean, it, yeah, Janine, it, if, you, uh, if you're still here and you, you remember where that came from, uh, shoot me an email. Or shoot Mike an email and yeah, let I would us like know. To know. I'd like to. Uh, let me scroll down to the bottom. Oh, that is bottom. Um, there was a question about uh, what's the best way to get rid of bamboo. Oh. Um, <laughs> um. Yeah, and it's the, if it's the Asian bamboo, you know, we're growing the native, I don't like to call it bamboo, let's call it the native river cane, the run the narrative yes. gigantia. And you know, it's just so much more forgiving. Now, it's a grass, bamboo is a grass. It's a tall grass, but it's a grass. Um, and it spreads by rhizomes, um, excuse me, stolons, like Bermuda grass would. So you, where, wherever you use of any Arundan area or the Asian bamboo, you're gonna get the spread of. Uh, we had a, a, a project years ago over um, in the West National area where there was uh, the bamboo coming from the neighbors and we went in and put a, a, a metal plate edging. And we had to go a foot down to prevent that from spreading. And even so, if all that bamboo will find uh, a crack. Um, you know, who knew, <clears throat> you know, all those plants that we are looking at now as invasive non-native species, we didn't call them invasive non-native species. We call them non, you know, they were our landscape plants. When I was a kid in the 60s, my mother took my brother and I over into West Nashville where I-40 was about to be built, and we dug up privet because that was the, the shrub of the day. We didn't see it escape. I remember driving by the Warner Parks in West Nashville and not seeing privet. So bush honeysuckle. Now we know Nandina and burning bush. Oh gosh, Bradford pears. What have we done? You know? So, I mean, we, we, you know, and it's bamboo is going to be right up there with it. The big thing about bamboo is that it doesn't recede itself like a lot of these other non-native uh, invasive species. Uh, and that could be a good thing. So if we can figure out a way to control it and keep it in, in check, um, you know, but this side of a deep metal plate and you got to go a few inches above ground as well, I don't know what else you can use. So here's the question that gets asked over and over again. Um, how do you help the public appreciate a natural landscape? I'm struggling mm -hmm. with my administration at school ideas besides giving them a copy of Doug Tallamy's books and forcing them <laughs> to read it. <laughs> Rule number one, I've got it. Some of you guys have heard me say this over and over and over. Never ram it down their throat. Never force this on anybody. We as gardeners are picky, funny people, okay? And our landscape, whether it's a small little quarter acre lot or 127 acres, we are very protective of our kingdom, of our yard, our landscape. So never say this is what you need to do. That's a lot. They're going to rebel. People are going to, you know, you got to do this. If you don't do this, this will happen. No, you let them accept it on, on uh, their terms. Now, so I am at heart, I'm a purist. I, I like straight species, especially out in the natural. In suburbia, where someone had Bradford pears lighting their driveway, 
and they love it, I may come in with a cultivar of some red bud or some other tree that has got a little more glitter on the package. And I'm going to let them accept that. So, oh, hey, Mike, wow, that's native. Wow. Now, it may not be a green leaf red bud. It may be a, a chartreuse red leaf red bud. Maybe it's a weeping red bud. But I'm going to let them accept that that's a native. And then hopefully down the road, I'm going to keep working with them and say, you know what? It's about time we get a little more purity. Let's go with straight species. Rule number one for me, never ram it down the throat. And then approach them by what is, what's going to excite them more. If you've got uh, a, a young couple with kids, uh, let, that, let that little boy, a little girl, look at a butterfly. Let them see that flower with all those little insects on it. Um, let them have a blueberry bush in their backyard in East Nashville and go out there and pick blueberry first thing in the morning. So, you know, approach them that way. But with, if you've got a bunch of dogs, yeah, you may have to put a little bit patch of turf grass in, but put something around it. We have had every kind of scenario over 25 years of how to promote native plants, okay? And I have now learned that I'm going to do what they want me to do. And, I, and if they want natives, fine, I'll do the natives. And then there's a level pretty much with everybody. You know, I've got people that have really talked at, at me about the, all the cultivars that I use. Well, we as a gardening society right now are not ready to go purist. I wish we could. Um, I'm ready for it. I don't know if it'll happen in our lifetime, but you know, so I'm going to continue to carry cultivars. Uh, if it's a Baptisia that blooms um, a bright yellow called Screaming Yellow, and it makes them want to put that in their sun garden instead of a penny, uh, yeah. So, so right now, you know, don't ram it down the throat. Let them accept it on their own terms. And sometimes a butterfly garden, just showing what a butterfly garden. What has happened in the past? Deck, few decades is that they have grown, no pun intended, these, these movements. You know, look at wild ones right now. What a great, I mean, wild ones here in Middle Tennessee 30 years ago, maybe not, but we're ready for it. We're primed. Uh, we get people moving in from California, New York, Florida, moving in and saying, you know, I had some native plants back there. What's native here? And you, and the educated. So educated. There you go. That's a big one. Let them accept it on their own terms and then do some teaching. Show them. Show them a flower. If you call it a federally protected plant and they can put it in their yard, whoa, I like that. So does that answer? Yeah, the, the I mean. Was that a 30-minute talk I just gave just now? <laughs> so in the, my, in the one, of the, one of the hardest ones is homeowner associations. I have two friends. Oh, yeah that absolutely have caught on with me on after seeing our front yard. And they literally have in some of these homeowner associations in the contracts, a percent, you have to have grass. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's as high as 80, 90%. And they were meant to stop other things, not other plants per se, but, but, um, so what one family is doing is they're, Every year they're planting like one or two, maybe three. And it's just slowly, they're just going to keep doing it until finally someone writes them a letter or something. And I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but it's it, the, one of the key things is I read was make, always make an edge. For some reason, if you have an edge to your, your um, natives, it looks still well kept. Yeah. But you know, if you didn't have that homeowner associations, you don't want those edges. You like kind of the, but anyway, homeowner associations are the ones that are tough. That I Well, can. yeah, and I'll tell you, we had uh, a couple of years ago, I, and I'm going to do a little name dropping here because he's a local guy that actually won an award down at the uh, Tennessee uh, Valley chapter um, of, at one of the uh, conferences down there in Chattanooga, and Jim Mahiran. And... Um, he approached us uh, from an HOA's point of view and said, okay, I cannot convince them to do prairie, pocket prairies, meadows, anything like that. But I can talk to them about saving money. 
And that's where a lot of times HOAs, if you say, well, gosh, how much are you paying annually for mowing? And then, you know, you go into the, the ethical part about, you know, environmental issues about the, the, the two cycle engines are just, that's your big source of pollution right now. And the noise pollution, you know, and those just manicured, you know, but if you start saying, well, gosh, you could save a lot of money by putting this little, and, and again, do this in phases, small little sections, uh, do a little pocket prairie over here. And uh, all of a sudden you get the butterflies in everything. They're much more attractive than, than the golf course look. Uh, and then let the HOA uh, uh, accept it again on their terms and say, okay, I like that. Or can we do that over there? Uh, but you're saving money if you approach it and say, okay, if you've got you know, a huge thousand house subdivision and they're all this common ground around it, okay, because they got to have the retention ponds, they've got to have all this for stormwater uh, uh, regulation. And uh, if you say, well, you're going to save a lot of money from mowing if you do this, and just don't put that right next to the pool, you know, or right next to the playground. Uh, but uh, back it off a little bit and go into these areas where they're doing all the heavy mowing. Uh, so what Brian was talking about, the edges, Doug Tallamy calls that cues of care. And I noticed that Donna Edwards uh, is here from the Smoky Mountain chapter. So we actually have hey, at least four Wild Ones chapters represented in the audience tonight. Yeah. Uh, and let's see if I've missed any questions here. You know, chemicals are expensive too, Sue Bible points out. Very true. Um, my neighborhood spends money um, dealing with bush honeysuckle because it inches, it goes out a few more inches each year encroaching mm -hmm. in, in places. So um, I'm thinking about sponsoring a, a weed wrangle if, if we're able to get outside and do work together and just start ripping that stuff out. We have a, about 25 acres of common area that, that uh, we have to maintain. Maybe you can tie into that what you can replace it with. Well, exactly. You know, here's my thing, and I've had to do this so many times before. This is where we're calling it, you know, in residential landscaping, we're actually calling it restoration now, and in backyard, uh, rec reclamation, okay, is that you've got nothing but bush honeysuckle. And to understand that plant, you got to understand the allopathic properties of the roots. In other words, that those roots exude almost like a a, a pre-emergent herbicide that keeps other plants, from, you know. So if, if, as soon as you eradicate, if you don't put something in there that, that is equally as aggressive, okay, that's native, um, then, you know, it will come back. And, and if you leave an opening, it will come back. So I showed photos of Navusia alabanensis, Alabama snow reef. And for that to be a, a state-listed endangered species, it's one of the toughest plants I grow. And I will put that around bush honeysuckle anytime. Uh, and it does have a colonizing effect. And so it will spread. So what you do is it let that spread out, okay? And that keeps the bush honeysuckle from encroaching back. Uh, there's no guarantees on that. I've seen it, you know, the bush honey, it's, it's, it is a fight. You got the invasive bush honeysuckle from Asia uh, fighting this native endangered species and who can win out. Uh, I will also use um, the viburnums, the native viburnums, arrowwood viburnums. They are not as uh, uh, as colonizing, um, but uh, there's a, a bunch of shrubs. You know, a common shrub out in, in, in our fields out here in Fairview is the coral berry, Simplicarpus abiculatus. Um, and it gets up about three, four feet tall, has the coral berries in the, in the winter. Uh, look at how it grows and you know if anytime you see one plant spreading out is a good plant to take the place of those invasive non-native species. Uh, Janine has a comment uh, from Southern Kentucky so go ahead Janine. By the way if you want to make a comment you can and you're not on a personal device you can hold down the space bar and that will temporarily unmute you as long as you're holding the space bar down. Okay Janine. Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention about the people mentioned milkweed was really aggressive. Uh, there are a bunch of plants that are quite aggressive, and if you put them all together in the same plot, yeah, they yeah. fight it out with each other. So if, you need a big space for it. 
um, but I've got my milkweed and my goldenrod and uh, my tall prairie grasses all together. And so they're, they're keeping each other in check. Yeah, and that's a good place for them. Good for you. Very good. Thanks, Janine. And by the way, you, you guys are doing great work up there. Um, Thanks. Rolling. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. We've had a, we had a designer come down a couple of weeks ago, never been to our nursery before. And she got into the native movement because of the wild one chapter up there. Great. Um, yeah, I think Tennessee has three chapters now, as I believe does Kentucky. So um, we, the Wild Ones is actually having a bit of a growth spurt in terms of number of chapters and membership uh, over the past several years. So we're glad to see that. Uh, there was a question about trumpet vine. I'm trying to find, uh, I think it was how to get rid of it, actually. Hmm. Yeah, is there a good way to get rid of trumpet vine? Hmm. A good way, an ethical good way, no. Um, you know, putting it in the clipping. right spot, you know. All right, I clipping to, besides the hummingbirds come to the trumpet. Yeah. Put that on a chain link fence. Whoever, that guy that invented the chain link fence, and I guess his last name was Link, um, <clears throat> you know, um, God, how many times have we seen, what do we want to do? You put a, a, a vine that can grow 50 feet, how many times have we seen trumpet vine go up a telephone pole? If you put the plant in the right spot, again, this is all about scale. Um, you know, again, I found out that the cross vine can get 30 feet from one plant. Well, you can use that to your advantage if you put it in the right spot. But as far as eradication, uh, and it has an uh, unbelievable half root. Got it. I, I tuned in a little late. I'm Alice, and uh, and I'm always believing. If you have some la uh, some land, and there are natural plants growing, find a way of taming them rather than eradicating and putting this artificial uh, so-called lawn in there. And I'm very much against weed killer for anything, even the electric companies. And, and so, so uh, they actually, uh, I'm now on the list for no spraying. And, uh, and uh, I, managed, I managed that because anything that grows wild and can be in any way uh, kind of, well, the species, the species that get disturbed, my neighbors are super in disturbing any species, water species, and so they get disturbed and they cannot be uh, transplanted and uh, they want to put concrete into the spa uh, spaces. So that's how the wilderness out there is, uh, is diminishing uh, all the time. And, uh, I'm uh, happy when along the roadside grows some uh, uh, root back root back here or or something like that in a wild in a wild stage and does not get uh, weed killed uh, uh, down. Okay, thanks, Alice. Um, other questions, comments, accolades. Great job, Mike. No, oh. <laughs> when, when you said acc accolade and you said Great job, Mike. I wasn't sure you meant me, so I. Oh, I mean, we have several mics in the audience. So, yeah. so, so you guys see? Yeah. All right. Look at, look, look at all the native plants. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? Whoa. Now tell me, there's not enough to choose from. Looks good. I, my uh, my spouse has been bringing in uh, plants from the flowers from the yard. Uh, grasses. She she's discovered grasses. I brought brought in a bunch of uh, panicum forgotum. It was about four feet long, and we put it in our biggest vase, and it it was a real showstopper. Okay, I think that's the end of the questions. But uh, Mike, uh, thank you very much.
Uh, you're, you, if you want to come back and give an annual speech, that's uh, that would be great. But uh, we'll we'll revisit this in a in a year and see how you see how things are going. Yeah, I would like to go back and do it live again. But you know, I have to say, of all the you know, I've given talks in Pennsylvania and in Atlanta, Georgia, and North Carolina, and all you know, all over in Texas. Uh, this has been a great uh, presentation, and the fact that I, it's the shortest drive I've ever made. Right. That's like I say, you, there's no reason to be late to a Zoom meeting. Um, but I've, the only problem I have is meetings are so easy now. This is my fourth Zoom meeting for the day. So I'm, I'm about Zoomed out. So yeah, um, zoomed out. yeah pretty much. Right. Well, I'm counting the, our little short meeting earlier as one of those four. All right. Uh, thank you again, Sorry. Mike. Thanks thank so you very much. much. All right. Okay. I'm going to end thank the meeting. You. Bye, everybody.